Welcome, everybody. This is week 34 of ENM 2020. And we have two more of our Frontiers talks this week. Uh, one of them is about uh, full replicability of uh, ecological niche models, essentially going beyond the section that we've already done on um, on workflows and, and documenting uh, niche model metadata. Yeah. Um, and so we have the we have the two uh, authors of that presentation, Luis Gadelia and Maria Luisa Mondelli. So they're, they're with us today. And then we have a section on, we have a, a talk on, uh, we have a talk on time-specific ecological niche modeling. And that was presented by Kate Ingenloff, who was a doctoral student Miss. with me. Sorry. And uh, Kate is in the process of moving to Yale to begin a postdoc or a, a postdoctoral employment. And so she's not with us, but I think I can stand in for her. So um, welcome everybody. And uh, oh, and also we have Jorge and Mona and Marlon as always. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to go right to the questions and we can see what we find. So, uh, wait, 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 vertices are the corners of a polygon. It's <laughs> where two lines come together. I'm recording, sweetie. Sorry, guys. Um, Okay, there's a question. Do, do you all have any questions that you would like to take on right away? Speak a look. Excuse me. <laughs> Nobody has any questions? Well, I do have one, but maybe later. Okay. Um, well, if nobody volunteers, here's one for Kate. Um, on August 2015, the suitable area is very broad in Canada and in Mexico, and it is clear that it is associated with the breeding. Why does the species prefer the East Coast? Well, that's a really neat question, uh, and it's the question of identifying biogeographic barriers. Uh, and for those of us who live here in Kansas, it's actually a really neat one because we live almost exactly on the western border of this species geographic range. And so the question to me devolves into perhaps uh, things manifested at, at finer spatial scales, which is to say that species is a species, this is wood thrush, it's a species of humid uh, temperate forests and really those humid temperate forests end right here in eastern Kansas, eastern Oklahoma, eastern Nebraska. Uh, essentially as soon as you get away from the Missouri River you don't have those deep humid forests with with you know sugar maples and things like that, um, and so I think there's a there's a bunch of things that go together to limit that species range. One is that habitat, which is manifested at a spatial scale finer than the climate, but another would be um, the climate, and you can see that very clearly in Kate's models because the species potential distribution kind of ends at the eastern edge of the Great Plains. So, you know, th these, are, these are questions that probably require a little bit of natural history information. And luckily that's a species for which we have lots and lots of information. In fact, that's why Kate switched from albatrosses for which there's a lot of complexity and maybe some big information gaps to wood thrush 
to demonstrate this methodology, just because we know a lot more about wood thrushes. Any other questions that you guys can pick out? I have a question, but it's not for me. It's for either Luis or Mari Maria. Okay. So I'm Which gonna, one? It's 3,000. 3,000. Is there a possibility in the future to have an automatic workflow for ENM? Who would like to comment on that? That's uh, three three thousand, right? Yes. Is oh. there a possibility of an automated workflow for niche modeling? Uh, yeah, maybe I can pick pick it up, and uh, if Maria Luisa wants to to comment further. Uh, so in the in our presentation, we showed some uh, already existing ENM tools. Uh, that were implemented in, using workflow management systems. Uh, so we have examples using Kepler, also using Vistrails. We also presented some uh, uh, niche modeling tools that are uh, implemented in scripting language like R and that also use some of the workflow techniques in, in the implementation, right? Uh, and these already provide some degree of automations. Uh, for instance, if you want to execute uh, your niche modeling workflow with some automated parallelism, it, it, it is possible. Uh, also, many of them keep track of the parameters used um, in the, the niche modeling algorithms. So to uh, uh, facilitate uh, later the reproducibility of the analyses. So there is a, a number of implementations with some degree of automation, but we believe that uh, as far as we, as we know, uh, uh, at least in the near future, it will be uh, still difficult to do a full automation because you need some interaction with the expert. Uh, uh, for instance, the, you, we, can, we have some systems that require the expert to, to at least do some, some uh, filtering on the occurrence data to, to check, check some, some uh, really evident uh, mistakes or errors in this data. Uh, so we, we think that in the near future, is, it's, uh, the input from the expert will still be needed as, as we can see in, in many of the implementations. Well. I think I think that's that's the answer I I, I wanted to hear. Uh, I I I think I don't know if they were referring to having uh, something that automates the repro reproducibility of the process, and probably that will be easier because the decisions will have made already uh, will have been made already, uh, but but. Automating the entire thing in ecological niche modeling is, it's to me impossible without the input of the experts at different steps, not just one. Uh, and only once that is defined, you can replicate that probably exactly the way they did it, but not, uh, I mean, each species requires different decisions. So it's impossible to have something that automatically works for everything. I think that's a pretty important point. We're talking about two very different things. What Luis and Maria Luisa are exploring and developing is making an experiment completely repeatable. And that is spectacular and incredibly exciting for science. I know that the four of us who kind of do the, the biology side have all tried to repeat somebody else's procedure. And we've tried that many times with many published papers or, or published results. And they're never repeatable. There's always some detail in there. And so this technology that, that you guys are presenting, it's fabulous, right? It's, it's kind of 
brute force fabulous, but it gets the job done and it tells us how deep we have to go before an analysis is truly repeatable. And that is fabulous. Now, the other question is, can we just set up a program and have it just run and create niche models for any and every species completely automatically? And the answer is, yeah, you can. But if you've been paying attention for the past 33 weeks in this course, what you're going to get out is a very generic, very suboptimal, just kind of a quick description rather than a more rigorous, tuned, customized model. And, you know, if that's all you want, if you want some quick and dirty map, map fine. But that's, you know, let's not call it a rigorous ecological niche model. So, you know, I think what I've been in this, in this field for 20, 25 years now, Jorge, how many times have we seen people try to do, you know, models for all the species in GBIF? I can um, think of there, at least five there, there are There are, there are <clears throat> things running models all the time and producing maps that nobody uses. No one. Because that's not the way of doing things. Well, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. But, you know, the other side of this um, <clears throat> question is, let's imagine, you know, the birds of the world or, or the vertebrates of the world or the species of the world. Right now, the only source of, of maps for every one of those species would be what? Our favorite IUCN range maps. And that's just for vertebrates. For terrestrial vertebrates. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of temptation. I'm going to point my finger towards the world of macroecology, where people are always wanting to do the global analysis of X. There's going to be a lot of temptation to run, you know, the birds of the world. It's only 10,000, 12,000 species. So I would suggest that people watch out for this second use and look at it very, very critically. Think about every lecture we've had in this course and all of those individual considerations that those make us think about. It might be choosing an M area. It might be fine tuning parameter settings. It might be how you thin occurrence data to avoid biased inputs, whatever. But there is a crucial place for expert decisions at many points in this process. And those get left out when we fall into the temptation of trying to automate the whole thing. So Tom, what I think what we are saying is that we are not against macroecological studies. We are just against automated, automating or using the same, the exact same uh, selection of parameters or choices of environmental data for a hundred species. So I don't know, I, I, I don't want to discourage people from from using ENM for macroecological questions, but they have to be optimized the models, right? Is that what we are? Well, I, I would go a little more critical than that, which is to say, you know, you could easily take ENM eval or KUENM and get different parameter settings and different um, environmental data sets for each species, right? We have those model selection platforms now. So it wouldn't be just, you know, running every species identically. But I actually would level some very severe criticisms at the field of macroecology because of their woeful and disappointing overuse of those IUCN maps, which, you know, in my well-founded scientific opinion, they are bullshit. 
And yes, I said that on YouTube, it's bullshit. Uh, we know that they are full of crap. you recording? Yes. And these are words that are not as bad as the words that some of us use, Jorge. So, I mean, these, those IUCN maps are, I mean, my, you remember my description. They are maps drawn by experts with a ton of knowledge and the experts have crayons, okay? And they draw these very entire, very smooth edged range maps. That's not what the world of species distributions look like. Well, let me tell you something I just did last week. I took all the terrestrial vertebrates of Mexico, all of them. The database, which is occurrences, the models that you, among others, created for Conavio, which are niche models with an M, so it, they are cookie-cutted. And they're, uh, that are quality controlled very carefully. And the IUCN maps for the terrestrial vertebrates of Mexico. And we did presence absence matrices at coarse resolution. <clears throat> and then compare the, the, the statistical patterns of the three data sets. The raw data is completely different. It is random, basically. The two others are indistinguishable. Models and IUCN, indistinguishable at a statistical sense, large scale. If you go point by point, you will notice differences. But if you look at the entire pattern, the pattern is very similar. You're, you're being too easy on it, okay. <clears throat> I, I, I am an empirical person. I follow the data. No, you aren't. You're a, you're a theorist. <laughs> well, I was just going to support Mona. There are interesting macroecological questions that can be addressed by the suitable tools. And if the suitable tools available are niche modeling, fine. Use those. Okay, but I mean, I just want to come back to the IUCN range maps. I'll put this um, this paper online for people to read. And one of the things that we are critiquing is the use of IUCN range maps. And those same Mexican vertebrates, here's Atlapedes pileatus. And what you can see is points documenting real populations. And then you can see the IUCN polygon. Here's Boraman varenticeps. Here's Lepidocalaptes leucogaster. All I'm saying is there's a lot of error in there. And maybe if you treat, you know. One by one, yeah. Maybe if you treat things at a very coarse scale, for that very coarse scale, you get something that's usable. But I mean, look here. Here the range polygon didn't even hit the range. See that? or this isolated population of this species was not known to the experts. And this is hundreds and hundreds of cases. And in fact, here's a plot of the percent of known occurrences falling within the IUCN polygons. And notice that especially for more poorly known species of birds in Mexico, oftentimes half of the points fall outside of those polygons. So, okay, yeah, Jorge, I'll, I'll take your point and say, yes, one could use niche modeling for uh, macroecological questions, but do it right. Yeah. Right? I mean, let's, let's do it right and get to um, get to initial data inputs, which are say, which is to say, species range summaries that are adequate and appropriate representations of species ranges. Another I, question. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Unless somebody else wants to to address one, I have one. Go ahead. Which one? 
Okay, this field is now a lot studied. Which could be new challenges to this field? Okay, so I would uh, separate that my answer in two things. One is the all the theoretic, the, the, the technical methodological issues which are being advanced all the time. Every, every week we see new papers um, making it better in terms of including uncertainty or selecting better the parameters of, 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 of algorithms and stuff. So those are mostly technical, methodological, statistical issues, and there is a lot of advance on that. The, the field is growing and growing is not static. Uh, but I would like to talk a little bit about the, which maybe there are the, the deeper questions or the more conceptual questions. And I think there are several areas of, of research that are extremely important in this field. First one I would like to mention is including interactions, biotic interactions. <clears throat> Mona has worked on that. Um, I, have, I have worked on that a little bit. It's a very difficult area. It's very important. We know that uh, while interactions matter, probably we don't even have a good empirical assessment of how much for what groups at what scales. We suspect that scale matters a lot for this interaction thing. <clears throat> so uh, interactions, including interactions in, in niche modeling, I would think it's one of the uh, new challenges. Well, it's not new, it's been there forever, but it, it's difficult to address this challenge. Another one would be to add dynamics. The, the, the correlation on niche models are static. There are predictions of what may happen if no interactions, perfect dispersibility and all that. So adding in adding dynamics to this field is, is also another challenge. And of course, again, there are quite a few attempts <clears throat> by European groups, by Tiago Rangel, by others, uh, ourselves included. But I think that's another, another area. <clears throat> Third one is adding evolution. We assume that the world is, con the niches are conserved. We know they are not really conserved, but how are they changing? How is the adaptation uh, of, uh, to different extreme conditions drive and, um, uh, the theory of how, how interactions, um, well, what constitutes an interaction and, 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 a, uh, and uh, uh, range of distribution? That's another one. So I'm forgetting one or two, but those three are in my mind, important avenues of research that are wide open, despite the fact that there is pioneering work. And um, I see the, 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 the field evolving um, in these in this directions. Yeah. In fact, um, Alexandre Diniz Filio in his introduction to the frontiers section of this course, um, gave a, a, a taste of the work that he's doing on what he calls evolutionary rescue. And that's yes. essentially, you know, we do these, these static niche assumption projections of, of what's the future potential distribution of such and such a species. And, you know, so they're essentially envisioning current distribution, future distribution, so this part of the current distribution starts to become uh, unsuitable for our species. And the question is, um, to what degree is it possible that evolutionary change in ecological niche essentially rescues those populations by, by the species or the population adapting to those formerly unsuitable conditions. So be sure you check out that paper. That's a really neat one. And in fact, the, um, the, pay, the presentation that we'll put online on Monday, uh, which will be Devin Derad, who's a, a doctoral student 
um, in ornithology working with Rob Moyle here at, at KU. Um, but Devin and the, the KU group are working on uh, understanding the genetic genomic basis of ecological niche traits in an African mosquito. And essentially what we're coming to is almost for the first time, there've been little bits of, of understanding previously, but almost for the first time we're getting a view of our ecological niche traits controlled by a few genes of large effect or many genes of small effect. And, you know, it's, it's just beginning to scratch the surface of getting the information that'll tell us about the evolutionary potential of ecological niches. You know, we're just, yeah. go ahead, Marlon. And I guess it's even a little bit more than that, it's telling us that some populations may be able to uh, face climate change differently than others. And that's kind of like a huge deal, especially considering the history of adaptation in, like for each population. I think that's gonna be something that has never been discussed, at least with data. I can say that it's some, this topic is related to the, um, the temporal aspect of modeling that, and Jorge mentioned, you know, we do static modeling. Um, because if we think about a mosquito versus a tree, the rescue effect will be different. So we go back to, okay, we are running models, but we have, we can automate a lot of it, but we still need to think about the biology of the species. So the you know, life history, the life cycle. Um, yeah, so the uh, challenge would be to, um, I guess a challenge would be to, to think more biologically about, about um, the models and in various aspects that have already been mentioned. I had a, I, I was interested in a question that was, um, was asked uh, for Maria Luisa. So I don't know if you don't mind, Maria Luisa, um, it's question 3029. 3029. Um, and it's short. Uh, the question uh, asks, is there any standard me method to measure reproducibility in ENN? And I thought it was a, an interesting question. So I don't know if Maria Luisa, if you want to comment on this. Well, um, I think that there is uh, no standard uh, method yet. But um, my way of thinking, maybe Luis um, can, Professor Luis can uh, comment too, but um, I think that the, the checklist uh, for reproducibility in ENM can be a way of um, allowing uh, this measure uh, to be done in a certain, certain level. I think there is uh, work to be done uh, in this part and the use of this checklist to check uh, which data was used, uh, which methods, which parameters, uh, how you evaluate your, your models and methods. I think this is a way of um, getting into this, into this measurements. But Maria Luisa, what you were doing was essentially uh, a data-driven approach. Uh, in, in, the, in the paper we published uh, on reproducibility, what you had done was basically to say, well, let's look at the fine details of what comes out of the model and see, you know, qualitatively, do we get close to the result? But then also quantitatively, do we get exactly the result, right? Yeah. So that's another that's another kind of way of of evaluating it. You know, one is did I do everything the same as as well as as far as I know, but another is can I replicate the the results exactly? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, combining these two approaches, uh, the checklist with what we have been doing uh, can, uh, can have a great impact for reproducibility. So I think there are two ways of thinking about how to measure uh, reproducibility and we can combine this uh, two different approaches. I, I just have a comment on this. Uh, this. This ideas of reproducibility are critical for science and as critical as they are, uh, they are so complicated, they are so difficult to, to achieve. Uh, reproducibility, for me, in the analysis we do, it has a lot of complications because <clears throat> sometimes, like, uh, like most of the time we use multiple tools. Sometimes they depend on different systems and stuff like that. And I guess the work that uh, Maria Luisa and Luis are doing, it's going to help with that. Uh, but the the thing about reproducibility is that it doesn't matter if it fails in one or two steps. If you don't get the same results, there's no reproducibility. So it's it's a question of, of a logical uh, answer, true or false, and 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 that's the hard part. Uh, and of course, you can solve certain things as uh, when there is an error or stuff like that. You can communicate with the person that did the analysis, but uh, it's always going to be hard. And and I forgot what, what else I was going to say, but uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's really interesting to try to do this like for the sake of uh, not only reproducibility itself, but uh, the progress of the knowledge that we have about certain things. It's, it's worth commenting. This is not just niche modeling. It's not that niche modeling is a, you know, a field plagued with, with problems of reproducibility. It's all of science. And, you know, some, some dimensions of science are light years worse off than we are. You know, my understanding is that, you know, clinical psychology had this horror where they, figured out that their standard methodologies of, you know, surveys and things like that were full of observer biases and, and special situations that literally could not be reproduced. And apparently they are revisiting their classic results and realizing that many of their classic results were just fatally flawed and actually reflect what the observer or the, the researcher brought to the question more than reality. And, you know, of all the different fields where I've worked you know, in, in uh, molecular systematics, same set of problems. Okay, so, so this is not a niche modeling problem. This is a science problem. And I will say things are way, way, way better now than they were even five years ago. You know, now it's relatively rare to publish something without the R code, right? Which makes me inviable as a scientist. But, but <laughs> you're better off than I am, Mona. Um, but just publishing the code instead of describing what you did is way, way better than what we were doing just a little bit ago, but we can do better. So that's why I'm so excited about, about the work that, that Luis and Maria, Maria Luisa are doing. Um, I got to visit them in, in their lab in Petropolis a couple years ago. And, and when I saw what, what they were doing, it was like, oh, I want to talk to these people a lot. So, um, again, it's not a niche modeling problem. It's a, it's a science problem. And maybe niche modeling has the potential to get out in front rather than lag behind. It's been a, to... a discussion even, oh, I'm sorry, Mona, go ahead. You go ahead. Oh, I just, I, I wanted to, to say thank you, Luis and Maria Luisa for, for clarifying terminology because we don't get trained. So this, I think, 
backing up, I think the problem of lack of uh, reproducibility in science is that I don't know how, how it is in computer sciences, but in biological sciences, we don't really get trained on how to make our research reproducible or, you know, that it's not a, fee, it's not a course that we take uh, as students. So, so first of all, we don't, we don't have much training. And then second there is, because we don't have training, terminology is, uh, at least I did not have the proper terminology. So when I was, Checking your presentation, I had aha moments, um, but that's all. Okay, you were going to say something? I was going to say that this problem of uh, lack of formality at, when reporting the methods that you said is a problem of science, uh, it's been used by science doubters to shed uh, doubt on what we do. And that completely misses the point. Scientists never said that they were perfect or, or, or infallible. What we say is that we strive to accomplish uh, improvements in what we do. And we do it in a, in, a, in a systematic way and in a collective way all together. And we improve to do things better all the time. And we do. This is the, the, what we are discussing is an example of that. But uh, I have seen some pretty unsettling uh, discussions among the doubters of everything, doubters of vaccines, doubters of climate change, doubters of everything. Evolution. Uh, oh, the scientists, uh, the, 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 there are in nature, there was a paper saying that they lack reproducibility, therefore nothing, nothing is good. We have to be very explicit about that we are improving all the time. And this is the, one of the fields of human endeavor where you can actually see the improvements all the time. In other fields, uh, there is a stasis, the way it was revealed to, by God 2000 years ago, it stays that way. So while we're on this soapbox, let's, let's go farther. You know, obviously, we've got the seeds of some technological solutions. Okay, we can publish our code, we can publish vignettes of what we're doing. We can go even farther and, and package up software and, and operating systems. But let's go, let's go in the immediate. You know, I read 50 papers a year to evaluate them for publication for various journals. Uh, and then I read an uncounted number of papers just that I see published and that I'm interested in. And over and over and over and over and over again, I see poorly prepared methods sections. And too often the comment is, well, the, the journal has a word limit of 5,000 words. So I decided to cut the methods down a bit, get a different journal, right? If the journal is not long enough to describe adequately, you know, if the journal's papers are not allowed to be long enough to describe adequately what you did, your paper doesn't belong there. And then you say, well, I put it in the supplementary material. Well, here's where we jump into another discussion on open access to the scientific literature, but contemplate this. You publish your paper in, you know, one of the one of the big journals, you know, ecography, for example. You may be able to retain enough rights to um, place your paper in the public domain. You'll be lucky if you can, but you may be able. But please remember that those supplementary materials are served on servers run by the publishing company. The publishing company usually ends up owning the copyright. How many times do companies get sold to something else or go out of business or change their mission? There is no guarantee that your supplementary materials will be there and will be available 10 years from now. 
or in the next generation of technology that shifts us away from what PDF documents on on websites. Okay, think permanence. And so that means, excuse me, I'm an academic snob, but that means trust universities. The only institutions that we have that have survived 800 years in the Western world are universities, correct? Mm -hmm. So trust your universities. We use as much as we can KU ScholarWorks, which is an institutional digital repository. And the university has the commitment to keep that digital repository forever. You know, I wish there would be a consortium of universities doing this as a pool, because I, I mean, although I trust the idea of the university, I don't trust the specific universities. I mean, I don't trust KU surviving forever, given the fact that the government is reducing the budget every day a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. I would trust more a consortium of, say, 50 powerful universities saying, okay, well, this is the repository of data for humanity for the next. I, I agree with you a million percent, Jorge. You and I both work for a university that gets its budget cut each year, and that was before the coronavirus disaster. Um, I will tell you that in other fields, there were multi-university consortia like in the humanities, and those are being bought up by Elsevier. So, you know, you have to watch very carefully and we all have to resist the temptation to go commercial or, you know, believe that a, a business is going to make a commitment that might last longer than the profitability. So, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe you're, you're right that, you know, University of Kansas might not be forever, but it's way more forever than a publishing company. I hope. I think so. At least that's what history says. <laughs> Although Elsevier has been around for 500 years now. Hopefully not much longer. <laughs> Other questions you guys would like to take on? Anybody see anything interesting? Uh, there is a, a question uh, about reproducibility, but I think that Professor Luis and I, we would like to hear from you actually. Uh, is uh, three, 3016, What's the best way to report uh, model uncertainty in terms of reproducibility and transparency? Hmm. Interesting. I guess in some senses, those are different things, aren't they? I mean, uncertainty is something that, that talks about how much variation or non-variation is there in the results that we get. It might be as a function of the occurrence data we have available or, or you know, the, the, I don't know, rounding error in some process. Whereas reproducibility is whether I can get to the same result. And so I think there can be high uncertainty or low uncertainty that is reproducible or not. Or am I misthinking this? You're right, but uh, I probably what they want to hear is how to do it, and and that's the problem. How to do it is not the the question to ask. Uh, you can measure uncertainty in very different ways. What you have to assure is that other people can do it the same way. I think that's the key, and and the only way to assure that is that uh, you describe. Uh, carefully your methods and probably you provide the code and the specifics you need to provide so anybody can do it. 
there is there is ways even in coding there is ways to try to get the same result when there is uh, any random selection or stuff like that and so those kind of details are important for instance so learning those kind of things may help which is to say describing uncertainty can be done in ways that are reproducible or in ways that are not reproducible but it's just the same as any other analysis we do yeah. There's not just one right answer. There's just do it in a way that can be repeated. I I have a question. It's not in the in the list, but Down and I have been talking about uh, the work that Luis and Lee, Maria Luisa are doing, and the way that they are proposing to uh, pack an entire set of uh, of software that can be used to replicate all analysis in a kind of a virtual machine inside your own machine and stuff like that. So uh, my question is, uh, if that is the idea, would it be better to do it the same way just to start the analysis? So even though you have a computer with some certain things and with all the programs we all have, just create a virtual machine and install the software that we are going to use and then do all the analysis there, and then try to pack the same kind of things and send that to uh, try to assure reproducibility. Is that is that a way a way to think it correctly? Yeah, I I think that uh, the work that uh, Maria Luisa did uh, goes a little bit in this direction of of um, creating the, the, an environment where the, the a virtual environment where the analysis, uh, the modeling can be executed and then packing everything and made, making it available in some repository. So this is, this is one, uh, yes, this is one uh, possibility I think that, but I think that there's a question of usability as well. So this should be as transparent as possible to the, to the scientist, because if it's something uh, very hard to to orchestrate and to prepare then uh, this will he, he doesn't have time to spend in preparing those let's say technical being involved in those technical issues to prepare an environment where he will do his ecological niche modeling so so this uh, and scientific workflows uh, I think that going back to that question on uh, automation uh, scientific workflows target mostly automating the parts that the scientists are not interested in being involved, like the technical issues of file transfer, parallelism, and so on. Uh, there, there is, uh, uh, so far, no intention to automate the science itself. The, 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 the objective is to uh, allow for the scientist to spend more time doing his science and less time doing those, let's say, cumbersome aspects of, of uh, working in a computer and composing your your workflows and uh, let's say I will run this on a remote server so I have to transfer the files and so on. So this is where scientific workflow technologies uh, concentrate on trying to automate these things for the for the scientists. Yeah, yeah the, I have to say one more casualty of the COVID-19 mess has been that Maria Luisa was supposed to come uh, to Kansas and essentially take on five or so case studies, which might have been, you know, different people in, in our broader research group. Let's go ahead and try this and see, you know, as you say, Luis, how cumbersome is, is it? You know, there, we have kind of different technological levels. You know, there's, there's kind of the Marlin level, a couple others of my students who I think could take on pretty much anything that a biologist could take on. And then there's, you know, kind of a next level down and a next level down and the next level down. And then there's me. Right. And, you know, if I can do it, pretty much anybody, at least younger than me can do. Uh, but 
that that will certainly determine how universally or how quickly these ideas can be can be incorporated into our toolkit. I think that I think that will also reflect the importance of not just learning like new tools and programming and all that, but uh, making science uh, kind of like transdisciplinary in the sense that you will probably need help in some things like installing things or preparing these virtual machines uh, from someone that has a more computer science background or stuff like that. But uh, that's if that's the case, I think it's worth. And if it takes like a day installing all things, I also think it's worth because like we do things that take a lot more time than that. And if you want a, a, a guinea pig, I can be that one. <laughs> I can try whatever you want me to try because I think it's very important. I, I think, you know, that that's the challenge of of making advances in technology accessible, right? You know, if it requires, I don't know, a, a, a specialist who does all of the setup, then the rate of adoption is going to be lower. You know, and you basically have to trust that the, the importance will be so high that maybe every university or every department would hire a reprodu reproducibility technician. Wonderful. But that depends on everybody appreciating how crucially important it is. You know, this also means that we need to do a better job at educating the new, the newer generations, because uh, the world is a more complex world than it used to be years ago, and we need to be better prepared. We mean all of us, not just scientists in their ivory towers. Yeah, the the, the citizenship, the, the the population, and 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 I I think we are to a degree failing on that task. Uh, I would like to see students better prepared in math, in computer sciences, in statistics, in, in formal thinking, of course, in the humanities as well. And what we are looking at is the, the opposite. So, <clears throat> well, you know, in our in our department, we have two required courses. Sorry, Mona, it's up from one required course when you were here. One of them <laughs> is biometry, which is great. And the other is what research integrity or scientific integrity. I wonder if there shouldn't be a day or a week in that course that focuses on making research reproducible. I think that would be a perfect topic. We have a course. Oh, sorry. We have a course in research ethics, like uh, similar. I think it's a similar around a similar or a similar idea, um, and but it's not required. Mm. And it's so popular, um, upper level undergraduates are flocking for some reason that course. Yeah. It includes various, it includes topics about like, uh, topics of um, using animals for research. So there's that aspect in the course too, but there is the ethics of doing rigorous research, repeatable, um, the ethics of being a, a, a researcher. And um, yeah, it's not required for graduate students. It, it is taught by, um, by a philosopher of science. And I had to convince one of my grad students to take that class because I, you know, I checked the syllabus and I thought this is a perfect, this is what graduate students miss in their training. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it gets, um, a little bit of resistance from from graduate students because there's there are many other you know requirements and time consuming things they have to do. Um, I was going to make just one other point uh, about the discussion of um, computer scientists so Louise and Maria Luisa helping us and even you know using us for guinea pigs. Um, I think this is really optimistic and, and positive compared to uh, my interactions with data scientists. Um, I'm in a working group and I'm the, I'm the 
one of the three biologists in like a, I don't know, 20 person working group that has data scientists. And their point of view is that we are lazy. We, we domain scientists, you know, biologists and whatever domain we are, we domain scientists are lazy and we need to pick up and start learning how to do, you know, HPC, how to run in para parallel, uh, how to do all these things. But I think that <laughs> I think that data scientists don't realize how low we are, like what kind of training we get. Uh, even getting like simple analysis through R, for many students it's really hard. So going from there to using use, using HPC to run, you know, multiple to run, let's say, <laughs> Bayesian models, it's it's a massive jump. And I tried to explain that to data scientists. And basically they said, we don't want to be, we don't want to um, be a service uh, to the domain scientists. We don't want the domain scientists to come to us and say, hey, I don't know how to run this in parallel. Please help me. So they were saying, you have to come to us with a question that is interesting to the data scientists so that the data science, so that this collaboration between the data scientists and the domain scientists helps both uh, both parties. So then the data scientists can publish in their, you know, field, in their, in their journals. But I think that's a very high bar to try to clear because I have no idea what is meaningful in terms of data science research. So I think we have to meet somewhere in the middle where, you know, the data scientist or the computer scientist comes and says, okay, I want to investigate this particular question and I need Marlon, Mona, Town, Jorge, as guinea pigs for my, you know, for my research. And then they, <laughs> the dummy <laughs> domain scientists, get something out of this. Um, but I think it's, I think, yeah, I think it has to, I think we all have to be kind to each other <laughs> because there's a huge gap <laughs> we are trying to, we are trying to bridge. Um, it also applies to mathematicians and physicists. I have been told several times by mathematicians your questions are trivial and I don't care about them and they're so stupid. I would never be able to publish that in a mathematics journal, so find out your own way. <clears throat> but you know, I think, I, I think it's a personality thing. Mm. I mean, my first major paper ever came when a very, very smart person in the department where I was studying pointed to something and said, this equation is correct. And the equation basically was that the mean of a product was not the product of the means, was not the product of the means. And now for 35, 36 years later, I know clearly that that's the definition of a covariance. But it was really interesting because that university had a statistical consulting service and they had statistician faculty who had a reduced teaching load and that reduction corresponded to their time commitment to consulting with dummies. And so I went to one of my professors and he didn't know the answer but he said, you know, if those two things are not identical, then I've made a serious error in all of my behavioral ecology work. You know, what's the, uh, the capture rate for a predator, which is an average, and what is the uh, average size of a prey item? That's the product of the means you get, oh, how much, you know, how many kilograms of meat is our predator getting? No, because if capture rate and prey size co-vary, they're not equal. And so the two of us went to this statistical consulting service. And I remember the, the, the statistician's name was Alan Welsh. And he was genteel and he was kind. And it was because it was part of his job. But the cool thing was, is he got a first authored paper in American Naturalist out of it. 
And I learned some lessons about working with people in other disciplines. So I was perfectly happy. But, you know, I think maybe that's a structural thing where, you know, if the statistician or the data scientist or whomever is being evaluated on his or her contributions to journals in that field, then yeah, there's not a lot of incentive to work with Mona or Town or, you know, or, you know, even with like that. But if part of their job is to work with people who need more pedestrian assistance, one, it's part of your job. But two, if you're smart at it, you find things that are interesting kind of at a meta level. It may be at a level beyond that of the domain scientist dummy, but it may be something that is interesting and useful to your field. I think we've, we've killed our hour, everybody, but thank you all for a very good discussion. Um, Luis and Maria Luisa, Thanks so much for joining us. Um, and we'll be back next week to talk about genomics of niche.